live from the Omni Hotel in beautiful downtown Smashville, Tennessee. It's a special Promoter 101 live podcast recording from the world-famous IEBA Conference. Join our hosts, Dan Steiny Steinberg and Luke, what you gonna do, Pierce, as they interview Live Nation's Bob Rue. Strap on your safety belts, grab a cocktail, let's party. This is Heath Miller. Becca Leifer. Ed Mike Cohn. Derek Dimenstein. Jason Kupperman. Jason Miller. John Schur. Marsha Vlasic. Mike Fruitman. Ricardo Baca. Peter Schwartz. Nick Storch. I'm on Promoter 101. Promoter 101. I'm on Promoter 101. Very excited to be here at IEBA today for this special recording of Promoter 101 Live. Make some noise, Nashville. Great to be here. We've got a rock solid show today. We're going to be joined a little bit later by Live Nation co-president of the Americas concert touring. Mr. Bob Rue is here from Live Nation. Give it up. We want to thank Pam and everybody here at IEBA for an amazing, successful conference. Congratulations to them on another sellout uh, of this conference for, I think, the third or fourth year in a row. They, they did just a- keep going bigger and bigger. They need bigger space. Absolutely. This has been a great event. We hope it's been productive for everybody as well here, too. Hey, Jim Cressman, Invictus Entertainment Group, and you're listening to Steiny on Promoter 101. This is the last stop for our tour. We want to thank everybody that saw us in Aspen, L.A., London, Austin, Toronto, Boston, and here today in Nashville. Thanks for supporting the live tour. Promoter 101 loves you guys. It has been an absolute amazing run. Dan and I have been doing this podcast for a little bit more than a year now, and it's I don't think any any signs of stopping here soon. We're going to be out on the road again next. Uh, if we haven't gotten to your town, there's going to be more stops happening in 2018. Can you give them a little bit of hints where we're going? Uh We'll say that, you know, we'll be taking a bite out of the Big Apple and some drinks and the Big Easy. I hear that the gathering of the Juggalos is, is going to have us there as well, too. So pretty pumped for some, some clown faces. Uh, in the meantime, you can always keep up with us. Website is promoter101.net. Follow us on Twitter. Dan is at the Jew. I have no idea how he got that Twitter handle, but it very well, early. Well, I'm born of Hebrew descent, Luke. That's very true. Our show's Promoters 101. That's Promoters plural. And I'm at W. Luke Pierce. Keep up with us. Do you feel like it's a one-sided conversation? Luke and I are really just doing all the talking all the time. It doesn't have to be that way. You can email us any of your thoughts, your questions, your feedbacks at Steiny at Promoter101.net. We and really can't wait to hear from you. And we promise to respond to every email. And Today, we're going to be taking a few of those questions that have been emailed in for Bob Rue later. So we hope that if you did take a chance to send Stani and I a note, you'll hopefully hear it on air today. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to Promoter 101 wherever you podcast. Drop us a review. helps us out on iTunes. Spread the word about your friend. We've been really, really lucky to have the blessings of the music industry and a lot of music listeners out there. So we appreciate your support. Continue to do so. If you've missed any of the past podcasts, you can always catch up at Promoter101.net. This week, we feature a special reissue of episode 14 with Works Entertainment's David Britz hanging out with some of the principals of Straight No Chaser, Segi Isho, and Dave Roberts uh, as we hang out a little bit in Maui with them and catch up on what's going on in their world. Plus, we chat with the brand new T-Mobile Arena's Sid Greenfig as well as Chris Zacker from the Levitt Pavilion. Plus, uh, Scott Perry jumps in to talk tech with us. It's going to be a pretty great episode. And if you haven't heard it, it's new to you. This is Mark DeTore. I am known as the Mad Manager, and I'm on Promoter 101. I do want to take a special note to acknowledge that we lost Terry Elam from Fitzgerald Hartley's Nashville office. He died of lung cancer on October 11th. 
He was an industry legend. He was really a nice guy. And the industry has changed greatly today that he's not with us anymore. We also want to take a moment on an up note. We always do a special Badass of the Week on Promoter 101, and this week we'd like to shine a spotlight on APA Canada's Ralph James. This man is already in the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. He played bass in one of the biggest bands of all time, Harlequin, and he books bands from the clubs to the arenas, always keeping his eye on what's breaking, and he's an amazing family man, making him this week's Promoter 101 Badass of the Week. Give it up for Mr. Ralph James. A finer men she couldn't know. Uh, John Huey, co-head of the office for CAA Nashville, Tennessee. Promoter 101. This part of the podcast is probably my favorite. You know, this started about a year ago because Dan on Twitter took to Twitter to t- ramble and muse a little bit about his day-to-day life in the music business, some of the dealings he, he would associate with the tweet and tag it, hashtag Promoter 101. So on the podcast every week, we take a minute to look back what Dan has said in the past week, break down some of his tweets, get into the mind of Dan Steinberg here a bit. So let me read off some of these things, Dan. We're going to have you talk a little bit about what you were thinking, what was going through your mind when you wrote these. Let's start with this one. When someone requests a meeting at a conference via mass email blast, hashtag tacky. Yeah, well, that was inspired by this conference this week. I don't know how many of you guys got those mass emails of, we'll take your meeting this week. Call me old-fashioned, but like... If you truly want a meeting with me, maybe just a personalized email that says, I want to meet with you, opposed to entire industry, blind carbon copied. We want to meet with you, blank person. <laughs> and I'm sure it's happened to more than a few people here in the audience today. I mean, click, copy, repeat's not that hard with email. You, you can, can even change ma- the name. I mean, come merge. on. You could even do MailChimp or right. MailMerge. There's something way easier than that. How about this one? Ironically, the phrase, state of the art, is outdated. That's a real thinker for you, Luke. <laughs> Uh, this one, when a festival lineup is announced and you don't know any of the acts on it. I guess it's a sign of just getting aged for sure, but man, these major festivals keep announcing and the festival lineups get bigger and bigger. And as you move down the list, it's like, I know less and less of them. Which one were you talking about when you wrote this tweet? All of them. All of them. It's a bad time of year, right? Come on, you guys know that feeling, right? It's like, did they did they have to buy a sandwich to get on that, that slot too? Like, <laughs> free with admission? Somewhere with the Lumineers on it in big, big, bold print. All the way to keep going, keep going. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> that does it for our Motor 1-1 Tweets of the Week. Make sure you keep up with Dan on Twitter. He's at the Jew. Very funny guy here. He's also got some great insight on the music business and the day in the life of an independent promoter. This is Lenore Kinder. I work for AEG Presents, and you're listening to Promoter 101. We're going to take a moment here, before we get into our interviews here, to... Uh, Flip this to our senior correspondent out in the field there. From ICM Partners, our senior correspondent, Promoter 101, Mr. Rick Farrell. What do you find out there in the field? Rick? Thank you, Luke. Thank you. I'm out here. We're here in Music City. I'm out in the audience, and the energy and the crowd is electric. The mood is palpable. It's like that scene in Footloose when those kids finally got to dance. Back to you, Dan. <laughs> That Rick. was incredible. We need more Rick Farrell in my life. Rick, before you move on, is there anybody close to you, any legends that you can uh, get their opinion on the street? Well, I would like to ask legendary concert promoter, Mother Hubbard. Barbara Hubbard, how do you think the Give panel's it up for going Barbara Hubbard, so far? Everyone. I'm going to put you in class, then. You can come teach 101 at New Mexico State University. We will come anywhere, anytime, and we'll do your windows because you earn that respect, my day are. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up, Barbara Hubbard, everybody. Hi, this is Nick Gold from Entertainment Travel, and I'm on Promoter 101. We'll take a second to wish some happy birthdays to some folks around the industry this week, October 16th to 22nd. Monday, 1023, road manager Larry Ross and agent Amy Davidman. On Tuesday, wishing a happy birthday to Billions, Drew Welburn, and promoter Howie Schneen. Wednesday, Enzo Demenso. On Thursday, happy birthday to Ali Shaw, Seattle Center's Joby Bowles, Pike Peak Center, Dot Litchick. On Friday, APA's Noel Leggett, manager Mary Hilliard Harrington, and Tim Drake. On Saturday, got to wish happy birthday to promoter in Phoenix, Mr. Danny Zalesko, Live Nation's Andrew Levitt, and UTA's Andrew Skinkin. Sunday, Nederlander's Mike Goldsmith. Happy birthday to everybody this week in the music industry from your gang at Promoter 101. Hi, I'm Holly Gleason, editor of Woman Walk the Line, here at Promoter 101, where they know how to get it done. How's everybody feeling out there? 
Are you ready for us to shut up and get off stage here? We're, we're, we're into the meat of it right now, and we're in a moment here very excited to welcome to the stage a man that, for many, doesn't really need an introduction, something you might say right before you introduce somebody. But please welcome to the stage right now the co-president of America's for Live Nation, Mr. Bob Rue. Thanks so much for being here, Rue. You've had an amazing career, starting at the University of Illinois at Champaign in 1978, building a relationship with Bruce Cap in Chicago in 84, your first job in 87 in Milwaukee at Stardate Productions, in 1990, starting in Houston at Pace Concerts, in 99, Pace sold to SFX, in 2002, SFX sold to Clear Channel, in 2006, they spun off into Live Nation, yet giving you another business card. And in 2010, becoming co-president of Live Nation. Is, is that about right? That sounds like it. All right, well, I guess we're good here. <laughs> <laughs> so that a little trip down Bob Rue history there. Uh, anything we missed in that? No, that sounds uh, pretty much it. It's been in, uh, about 40 years there. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good to condense it down in, a, in a 40 seconds there. All right, well, there's a lot of venue people in the room, and I, I think they all want to know the biggest question, the most important question of the day. Is there a piece of swag they can give you as a gift that's going to get you to bring them extra shows? Oh, okay. So um, lately I, I went through the closet because, as you know, Houston experienced some really tough times when Hurricane Harvey uh, hit our city about seven weeks ago. And I thought, you know, what can I, what can I do to try to help some people out? you know, that, that, that really experienced some of that devastation. So, you know, went upstairs and looked at, you know, all the various T-shirts and sweatshirts and hoodies and caps and, and got that out to some of the areas that were looking for clothing for the people that had lost some during the storm. So for everybody in the room that's contributed over the last 30, 40 years, there's a lot of people out there in Houston that thank you that are wearing Jimmy Buffett T-shirts and <laughs> Kid Rock trucker hats and, you know, some new uh, new coffee cups to uh, to use. So um, it's always appreciated, and, and a lot of what we've, uh, you know, put together over the last many years went to some good use, so thank you. Quickly talk about there's been a lot in the media lately between the war between AG and Live Nation and Oakview Group, the venues, the companies, the feud. Can we do a little counseling here and try to mend some fences? Can you say maybe three nice things you like about AEG? <laughs> like we're we're working right now uh, with uh, you know Allie and the national team here on a, a benefit concert that you guys have, have probably read about. It'll take place at Bridgestone Arena on November 12th, and uh, have really enjoyed that that process working with Allie and her team here for a for a great cause. It'll benefit. Um, both the victims of the hurricane relief and people that were impacted in the uh, recent events in Las Vegas. And so if you get a chance to come, if you're here in Nashville, please do. If you're from out of town, it's going to be a tremendous evening. They, they've put together a stellar, stellar lineup of country artists, and it feels great. Um, do a lot of work with, uh, you know, Louis Messina. You mentioned earlier when I went to work in 1990 at Pace Concerts, Louis gave me that job. And he's been a great mentor and friend and, and uh, remained close through all, all these years. And we're getting an opportunity to work together on a, a number of his tours this year. So, you know, the, the relationship is, you know, you mature and you, and you learn what's really important in life. You know, sometimes you get over some of the things that, you know, others might perceive as conflict and you turn them into a greater good for more people. And that's the beginning of, a, of an amazing footprint that you've left here and the impact that you've left here in Nashville, which is part of the country that you cover with your counterpart, Mark Campana, who's in Chicago. Yeah. Nashville's been a, a really expanded footprint for Live Nation since you guys took the reins, the involvement of Brian O'Connell, not just on the concerts front of things, but everything with a partnership from Ascend Amphitheater downtown here. So in your time since joining Live Nation, how have things changed here in Nashville? Well, very early on, uh, when I started Pace in 1990, we had just recently opened the Starwood Amphitheater here in Antioch, and so we were in the market at that time, promoting both there and also at uh, Municipal Auditorium. So early on, I had the privilege of being able to book a lot of uh, shows into the Nashville area. Later on, Murfreesboro, when that venue opened, I think we had an opportunity to Pearl Jam and many others out there. So I've, I've really, uh, you know, had a long relationship with the city. It's always been a great music town. I find it 
to be probably the easiest market in the country, probably the world to network, meet friends, you know, meet business associates. I mean, real great lifestyle here. People love to support music. And I was talking to Bob Babish earlier, and, and he was here on Friday night. He's like, gosh, Jason Isabel, six shows, Chris Stapleton, two shows sold out, you know, countless others around the community. And, you know, there's all this stuff going on here. And, uh, you know, it's come a long way since the early 1990s. You said a lot of new buildings now. I mean, Bridgestone this weekend hosted two phenomenal shows with Chris Stapleton, both sold out. Um, the management over there, David and Sean, just phenomenal to work with. Um, you know, you mentioned Ascend earlier and, and uh, you know, having a tremendous year now, just starting to finish up that building. Um, but, you know, since Live Nation opened a promoter office here, you know, we've really made some significant strides in the market. Um, I was talking to, to Pam backstage and, you know, she commented on what Live Nation has done over the last several years. And I said, it really starts with having a local promoter in Nashville. You know, of course, we had Brian O'Connell's Nashville touring team based here for many, many years. But they are, you know, their, their nice. ability is to buy country tours and then promote those on a national scale. And we didn't really, since closing Starwood many years ago, have a true promoter um, that day in and day out worked on developing artists and uh, building those careers here in this particular city. So we're fortunate when Brian Traeger, who had had prior experience in both our touring team, our Philadelphia office, our Chicago office, agreed to move to Nashville. Um, we were fortunate enough to uh, win uh, <clears throat> the opportunity for the contract at uh, Ascend Amphitheater. Um, later on, we were, we were able to strike a relationship up with Fontenelle, and uh, we have recently made uh, an investment in Municipal Auditorium and have gotten that show count up. So, you know, starting to build some uh, venue assets in the market, and, you know, we're looking forward to the next step of that. Uh, we have several other new plans for uh, our venue portfolio here. So essentially we can take artists from very early in their career, 500 seats or so, start building those relationships and trying to put them in the right venue in Nashville throughout their entire career. So you're co-presidents with Mark Campana. How do you guys split up the country? Um, well, when we started in 2010, I took the South, being in Houston, which was kind of, you know, the approximate, call it Mason-Dixon line South, and, and Mark had the North based in Chicago. And then a few years ago, and I forget exactly why, we decided to switch it East and West. So, you know, I have responsibility for our, all our promoter businesses um, in the West, you know, which is generally kind of West of the Mississippi. Um, and Mark does all our promoter offices and businesses uh, in the East. Then in addition to that, we kind of have, um, I would say, you know, non-promoter office responsibilities of various disciplines of the company, where I currently oversee um, our touring team and all, all of what they do, um, our central marketing team, which is a group of about 70 individuals based in Los Angeles that are now buying national media, digital, social, et cetera, uh, from a centralized platform. Um, Mark deals with all of our amphitheater and venue businesses. And so we have, you know, kind of various departmental disciplines that we're responsible for, as well as the geographical uh, promoter businesses. You guys have been co-presidents for a long time. It's seemingly you, you pretty big guy in the industry. Do you really need to be sharing that co with anybody? Should we take them out? We might need a third. <laughs> um, it, it's like it's it's a it's a real privilege to work with Mark Campana. I'm sure most of you um, know of him. Uh, Mark and I. It's ironic. I went to the University of Illinois. Mark went to Illinois State. He's from Ooh. Chicago. I grew up in the middle of the state, and uh, we met through a mutual friend probably in about 1977, 1978. So you know, I've had the great privilege of knowing him personally, following his career you know, with Niederlander and the things that he did prior to the consolidation under SFX. And of course, from SFX, Clear Channel through Live Nation, be able to work a lot closely with them. But I think because we met early on and we both had that love for music and, you know, both were on entertainment committees or boards at those universities, um, we shared kind of a, a common, you know, um, growth in our, in our careers, you know, from just starting out and being interested in the field 
to you know kind of developing our careers and our relationships you know sounds like a pretty amazing bromance it, it works it works really good but a lot of work even divided by two um this year in the u.s we'll do about four thousand uh shows so a lot, a lot going on and and um you know we, we both work really hard at our jobs that's pretty incredible. You guys have been really instrumental in a plan to kind of decentralize Live Nation as a company. When you came in and when you started, this was kind of a top-down approach. Call it one-size-fits-all, for lack of a better quick descriptor on it. And what you and Mark have done have created these kind of promoter pods in markets where you've entrusted the marketplace to a local promoter and a local business there that is understanding the market. And as a result, in the last seven or eight years, you've seen tremendous success and and a strategy that's really working at live nation so um don't know if there's a question but i appreciate yeah. the compliment uh, it's more of a it's more of a statement but yeah so so when we took over in in 2010 about the fall i mean as you all know you know the economy was coming off you know kind of a rocky 2008 2009 you know there was some impact on the live business in those years and so when Michael, you know, asked if we would take over the leadership for our, our U.S. concert business, you know, we thought about, you know, what was our what was our next logical step? Michael Rapino. Michael Rapino, okay. CEO of Live okay. Nation. Um, you know, what was the next logical step, um, you know, to try to kind of level set everything and start over? And, you know, Mark and I grew up in that era of, you know, local promoters had geographical territories. Um, we had an amazing group of, of promoters throughout the United States, which has expanded significantly over the last seven years. But we wanted to basically make sure that they were empowered to do what, what they've learned to do throughout their careers is just get up every day, you know, acquire talent you know, promote really hard, you know, be experts at marketing in their local market. But we also saw some of the benefits of centralization in talent acquisition. Um, you know, a lot of artists and managers were looking for one-stop solutions, you know, for a group of individuals that they could come together with and execute their plan. And so instead of having a lot of individual conversations across the United States, they could meet with one group, talk about the entire tour, how they wanted to lay that out, what combination of venues, the marketing strategy, make a singular financial deal, and then let us orchestrate that out with local level execution. And really, it's kind of the best of both worlds, centralization on the acquisition and some marketing assets, but also decentralizing the fact that we have experts now in 25 cities across the U.S. How many venues and how many tours are you guys running right now? Uh, without without the theater and clubs, because I, I apologize, I don't really know Ron's numbers on the number of theaters and clubs that we have here in the U.S., um, but we operate right now, I think, 53 amphitheaters um, across the U.S., and we have 25 of those promoter offices or promoter pods. Um, most major cities are, are represented by that. Um, and each have a you know geographical territory with a cluster of assets uh, that they're they're responsible for. So, how many tours are you running around the the U.S. now? Uh, this year, U.S. concerts will do about 120, I think. Are you coordinating that with Canada pretty closely? Yeah. So we book for Canada too. Um, the 20, 23, 25 local promoter offices are all U.S. And then we have offices in Vancouver, Toronto. There may be a third. Um, and when we buy a tour for U.S., it's typically U.S. and Canada. And now we're starting to expand and buy more globally when we have a relationship with, you know, acts, you know, like U2 and others, um, where they recognize Live Nation's presence throughout the world. Um, this year, we will do shows in 43 countries around the world, um, sell approximately 80 million tickets. So um, Globally. We're, yeah, we're taking a lot of... A lot of what we've built up in the United States and, you know, through our, our acquisition and other uh, opportunities have been able to spread that same kind of business plan globally now. Of that 80 million tickets, how many did you see, sell here at home? Uh, we'll do 40 million in the U.S., so about half. I mean, one of the strongest economies, 
um, in the world by far. Um, certainly a very mature business here in the United States compared to some of the markets that we're going into now, like South Africa, uh, Israel, uh, India recently. Um, and you know, we're, we're, there's still a lot of untapped markets as well that we'd like to uh, do more in. I mean, South America is still... Um, got a lot of potential for Live Nation, so we're, we're still looking at where, where we're able to expand around the globe. That's an incredibly diverse list of countries you just rattled off on that front of things. Does that give you an opportunity to program some serious diversity in the artists that you're, you're booking? So I, I'm learning that too. I mean, a lot of these countries, um, if you think about India as a, as a country and Italy as a country, I mean, they're like superstar acts in that are basically country centric, right? Like a lot of our, our um, superstar country acts here in the United States, you know, are unable to tour globally just because right. of their exposure in those countries. But it's it's the same thing in, in Italy and, and Israel and India and China, where there's just a huge, huge number um, of, of nationalist uh, entertainers that are arena level popularity in those countries. So you got to kind of know both what you can export around the world and what you have locally to work with. And a lot of that has to come back to, you know, the decentralized promoter pods you talked about there, having promoters that are keened in to what's working in a particular marketplace and what's working for their country, right? Yeah. So is there a moment where now that you've got all these local offices around the globe that you're getting to import more talent from around the world because you've got guys like Jason Miller in Asia that know the market so well that they're probably discovering more talent that you could bring in? Uh, for sure. I mean, a lot of Korean, I shouldn't say a lot, but this year, you know, we imported um, a several Korean pop artists into the United States. And so, if, if you know, you take somebody that's really, really popular in Southeast Asia, there's a strong possibility that those artists can work where you have similar population um, in the U.S. Los Angeles, Toronto, Chicago, New York, um, parts of Texas, you know, can really work well for a lot of international acts. So we, we're, we want to bring stuff here from around the world as well as export, you know, our artists. Yeah, can we talk about what your responsibilities are, your daily job that you oversee so much? What does that include? Well, with the promoter offices, um, we talk to them on a scheduled call once every two weeks, um, spend, you know, an hour and a half with each office just you know, talking about, you know, what's going on against their annual plan, um, what type of acquisition opportunities there may be to acquire a smaller promoter or partner with a small, smaller promoter in a market, um, what venue opportunities. We're always trying to build a complete platform like I talked about for the national market in every one of our major cities from club on up through the arena level. So, you know, we want to find out, is there a ballroom that we could, you know, we could build or is there a building that we could retrofit to get that midsize, you know, venue in these markets? Um, you know, how's the personnel doing? How are the staff doing? Do we need to add another buyer? Do we need to add another marketer? So you've kind of got that going on. Then we have, you know, both a U.S. touring call every week as well as an international touring call where we're really talking about um, what, what tours we're buying and then how those things get proliferated and, and pushed out into the marketplace. Um, we also have a U.S. Uh, talent buyers call once a week where all of our talent buyers are on a singular call, so we're in lockstep with each other on what the mission is. And then, you know, departmental calls, and then once a week, I spend about three hours with Michael Rapino, our CEO, just kind of downloading him on how the U.S. business is against plan and, and you know, trying to seek advice on things that he can help me um, with to, to just do a better job on, on what we're doing against our mission. Holy shit, when do you find time to talk to anyone outside of the business when you're talking to all these employees inside your own company? Uh, you know what, you, you have a, I don't know, over the years you get fortunate to just meet so many people. I mean, early on on conferences like this and throughout your career and, and it just starts to become, you know, kind of a, a natural part of the day, you know, whether it's an email or, you know, lesser and lesser nowadays, a phone call, I guess, which I, <laughs> I miss, but... Uh, you know, you just, you just you just do it. And we get a lot of incoming calls now for, you know, people that I've met throughout the year that may have an opportunity. Um, I went and visited a place uh, a few days ago, which just, you know, someone I had known from 
the past, uh, you know, thought there was a nice, you know, building opportunity. So they wanted to ask if Live Nation would be interested. So you get a lot of that kind of incoming, you know, as people know what you do and the services that you can provide um, and little things pop up and they bring them to your attention to see if we could work together. That's probably an interesting question for the room here today because there's a fair number of you know, venue owners or venue operators here in the room that are probably looking for Live Nation shows. You know, we joked about it, about sending coffee cups or turvis or whatever, but what is what does it take for a venue GM or a venue programmer to get on your radar? What are you looking for? Well, like, we, we, we do think now, I mean, with our, we have our club and theater division, which is similar to the U.S. Conscious division that I run. And the club and theater division basically focuses on venues with a couple thousand capacity down to a few hundred. So we have a, a tremendous um, kind of, a, you know, kind of a starter league, so to speak, you know, where we can discover brand new acts. I mean, we, we got relationships very early out of that network with bands like 21 Pilots, um, Imagine Dragons, where, you know, we were able to secure relationships early on and put those artists across, you know, maybe as many as 40, 50 kind of club and theater shows and use that to kind of grow those relationships as an artist's career um, expanded. And, um, you know, there's really no market too small for us. It's just a matter of finding, you know, the right type of programming and the amount of programming that will go into those size markets without cannibalization. Um, but we keep breaking our promoter offices down smaller and smaller. When we started, we had maybe 16 promoter offices. For instance, part of my job out of Houston, I was responsible for everything in Texas, everything in Louisiana, everything in Mississippi, everything in Arkansas, everything in Oklahoma. And in the last three or four years, we broke that down, opened a Dallas office initially with Danny Eaton and now with Anthony Nicolaitis. We opened a New Orleans office with Russell Dusan Jr. You know, and so we keep trying to squeeze these smaller and smaller. LA used to do LA, San Diego, Las Vegas. We opened a uh, Las Vegas office under Kurt Melian and San Diego under Candace. And so what we've learned is as you get smaller and smaller in the territory you're responsible for, you become more focused. And as you have more focus, you're able to do more things. And so you don't overlook the secondary markets because you have the time to do it. And so we will keep kind of squeezing down, getting tighter and tighter, and that will create more opportunities for a lot of people in this room to work with us and get a good one, one correspondence going with a promoter that's responsible for your particular part of the country. When Jay Massiano was on the podcast, he told us AEG's payroll overhead was about $200 million. With all of these offices, I assume you guys are seeing a bigger salary payroll than even, than even that. Do you know how many employees that you oversee personally? Well, see, worldwide right now, we're at about 9,000 full-time, um, and I think 23,000 in peak season where we have a lot of part-time for our amphitheater business and other things that occur in the busiest times of the year. Um, the U.S. right now is about 900 full-time employees, up from about 500 when we started in 2010. But, it, you know, we don't really get overly concerned with the fixed cost as long as we're growing the top line revenue and our bottom line profits. And that formula of continuing to kind of squeeze down, get more focus, buy more shows, um, is really worked for us. I mean, we've more than doubled our annual show count from 2,000 to 4,000 over the last five or six years. Um, we've, we've more than doubled our total attendance from the 20 million range up to 40 million this year in the U.S. And it just works as people get more focused, they can do more inside of a smaller geographical region. When I was doing Houston, I'd say, you know what, I'd be happy doing Houston and Dallas, occasionally New Orleans. We spun off New Orleans and the gentleman this year, I think we'll do 23 arena shows um, when I might have been lucky to do six or eight. And so when you get that guy waking up day to day thinking New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, you know, that market takes off. And then there's also residual effects for the secondaries like Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Shreveport, Bossier City. You know, those kind of markets have probably seen significant expansion. The touring team also has more confidence when they have a specialist in a small geographical region, right? If they were selling to me, they're like, 
Bob's busy, I can only give him Houston and Dallas. But now with a guy that's got a very small area of focus, the touring team feels more comfortable. So do artist management. And we're also seeing the number of dates per tour expand from an average of 30 or 40 to now 50 and 60. You know, because the artists feel more comfortable that we're selling out every show and they're walking out with more money. And of course, the US dollar is very strong right now. So we can also get a lot of access to do more dates here in the US. What, what are some of the tours that you're actually working on? Because you're not just responsible for all the things that we just discussed. You're actually out there looking after some acts right now. Right. Well, I've never, <laughs> when I took over this job, I kind of went from day-to-day promoter, which is what I grew up on at Pace, to a, a bit more of a managerial um, role within the company. But I never really wanted to kind of give up entirely on just what a promoter does, you know, acquiring those acts, learning what they want to do in the next step of their career, and then executing on that that plan to, you know, their satisfaction or above their satisfaction. So over the last um, year and a half, you know, I've had the, the great privilege to work very closely um, with Corn Capshaw on Chris Stapleton's uh, touring business. Um, just a, a terrific, you know, live performer, um, amazing, amazing individual. Um, I, I just, I just think a lot like he does and his wife, and that, that's turned into a terrific relationship for us. Um, also had had the great privilege this year to uh, put Tom Petty's last tour together. Um, was there on, on the first night when we started in Oklahoma City, and was there on the last night. Um, when we finished at the Hollywood Bowl and just, you know, the biggest tour he's, he's ever had. Very, you know, just tremendous effort out there every night. Um, and, you know, that, that was a tough one, um, you know, as, as you all know. But um, it, was, it was a great, great tour. Um, I was responsible for Metallica's tour this year in uh, stadiums. Like we did like 22 stadiums and just under a million, million tickets on that. Can I ask you uh, a side note on that? I heard a rumor that Rapino sat with Lars and cut that deal. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I know. And I won't tell you what I don't know. <laughs> um, I went out, Tony invited me to a show, I think it was last December, right before the holiday break, where they played a small venue in, in Los Angeles. And um, he said, hey, maybe later on we're going to have a little bite to eat, the band's coming over, you know, call Michael and maybe see if he wants to come down. So we went over to, um, you know, this little reception that, that they had, and, um, you know, Tony was very cordial and uh, made all, all the introductions, and I, I left way past my bedtime, and I think Michael and Lars were, were still talking, and, you know, a few days later, like, it's almost Christmas now, and Michael's like, I think you put a stadium plan together in a day. <laughs> I'm like, uh, so, you know, we worked hard over the holidays and, and put something together that uh, um, they must have must have liked and, and uh, you know, got the responsibility for that tour and uh, it turned out well. Yeah. Can you talk for a second about some of those, you know, inside points of those tour deals? Because we've got a lot of festival and fair buyers here, too. How do you work these big festival looks, a Bonnaroo for you two, into your tour routing? So, Live Nation, first of all, is the world's largest festival producer. Um, you know, we, we do festivals all over the world, and we're certainly looking to expand on that, that platform. Um, and, you know, when we're talking to an artist about whether it's a one-cycle tour, or in many cases, multiple-cycle tours we have a very deep relationship with, we, we want to find out what they want to do. You know, do they want to do an arena tour? Do they want to do a stadium tour? Do they want to mix in a few festivals? Do they want to tour internationally? If so, what parts? And so I can't speak for Arthur Fogel, who does the day-to-day responsibility for U2, but my, my presumption is when they were talking about what U2 wanted to do this year, which is a combination of some stadiums, there'll be some arenas, of course, the Bonnaroo date, you know, I assume the artist said, hey, we would be interested if there's some really flagship festivals in the United States that make sense for us. And, you know, I guess they must have gotten together on the economics and 
the dates and it seemed to work in their plan. But we, we do that a lot where, you know, here's, you know, 50 dates in the arenas. Here's, you know, 10 festivals. I mean, we're talking to um, C3, kind of my counterparties here in the U.S. that run the majority of our festival business and, you know, trying to find, you know, new, new artists that, that can gain exposure by being on those festivals that we want to grow a relationship with. Um, and more established acts that just want some of that uh, type of exposure, you know, above and beyond their standard arena, stadium, or amphitheater business. So there was a cha- change in the last couple of years. Paul Tillet put together the concept of, I'm going to go ahead and say old cello, even though he'll get pissed at me for it, but Desert Trip was possibly the coolest lineup that we've ever seen for a mega concert. They didn't come back this year, and you guys rolled out the classic in both the West Coast and the East Coast and did a little version of that in Seattle. Was that successful for you guys, and will we see that again? Uh, Yes, I I mean, it was was very successful. Um, You know, actually, Irving Azoff, you know, is manager of the Eagles and other artists that performed on those lineups, um, had the idea for some type of what I would call almost kind of the old-school, semi-multi-genre festival you know day on the green and you know that was the era i grew up with where you know you might have you know bob seeger opening for acdc you know musically in the 70s you you know you didn't get so compartmentalized and you know the uh the classic east and west when you think about having you know artists as broad as steely dan you know, to Fleetwood Mac, you know, to the Eagles, to Earth, Wind and Fire. It was it was really a, a cool concept and and um, you know, both East and West, two day shows in each market, um, sold out, they grossed about sixteen million dollars a piece. Um, you know, the artists made a lot of money. I think the fans also got a lot of entertainment for the dollar. Um, and it's a, a concept that, you know, we, we plan to uh, expand upon. Was Seattle always originally a plan, or was it just based on the success of the first two dates? Um, I'm not sure exactly the, the, where where Seattle started. I think the deal itself was made post uh, the Los Angeles show, and I don't know if, if people from from the field came uh, came to the show or how that came about. But I think you know Irving got an offer that he felt was attractive for the Eagles, and um, and so they they took that show before these next five or six that we have on that are actually starting. We've been seeing more and more steel and stadium shows going up around the country. When you own basically all of the amphitheaters, at least of massive scale, and you've got a baseball park where you have to build the stage and that's real labor, what is the factor of deciding whether to play your amphitheater for two nights if you can sell that many tickets versus putting up the steel? So, like Tom Petty in Seattle this year or Chicago. So you ask that question like I get a vote. <laughs> um, so so we, like we talked about it earlier, we, what we really want to do, and I think part of our, our success has been to really get an understanding from the ground up of what an artist themselves want to do. And what we found is if, if we come together with a plan that both sides are in agreement with, you know, artist, artist management, agency, as well as promoter, after we talk about all the pros and cons of different attributes of what that plan could be, those relationships will grow, the tour will be successful, and the money will follow. So we we try to work with each act and and develop exactly what they want. Um, I mean, the truth is that today's ticket prices, an artist can still make more doing a singular baseball feel than than most of even the largest amphitheaters. So there's more money if you're able to do the business and charge the ticket prices, but you got to be able to sell 40,000 seats as opposed to maybe 17 or 20. But in the case of Tom Petty, like you mentioned, um, you know, Tony, who's, who's been Tom's manager for so many years, understands the artist so well, understands the touring business so well, you know, he put together, I, I would say, if I was an artist, almost the perfect tour where, you know, Tom played predominantly indoor arena shows with some of the greatest outdoor buildings mixed in, with some great festivals, with these two stadium days, one in uh, in Chicago at Wrigley Field with Chris Stapleton opening, and another one in Seattle with the uh, Lumineers opening. 
And so, you know, Tom, you know, has toured a lot, you know, got a lot of different looks, a lot of different mixes. And I think that keeps the tour fresh, you know, when you're out there, you know, sometimes doing the same environment day after day, especially on a long tour like that one, you know, it, it might become a little bit rote. But if you can mix it up, then you got things to kind of look forward to, even as an artist, um, that might be a little different. And so I think it keeps the artists excited and the band excited. And also, I think there's a lot more kind of media attention that comes to something that has a lot of different attributes built into the tour. We do a little speed round. It's a little easy for a second. All you have to do, one or the other, you just can't say both. Pretty easy. Okay. Billboard or Polestar? <laughs> I would have to say Polestar today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm at Billboard. <laughs> you 2 or Metallica? <laughs> you can have a mulligan on that one if you want. I really love both bands. I saw both of them multiple times this year, and two of the greatest live shows on the road today. I and I, I've always okay, we'll let you say both on that one. We'll give you that one. <laughs> William Morris or CAA? <laughs> I think this is the part where we need some audience participation. <laughs> I, look, I enjoy phenomenal relationships with both. I mean, those are two tremendous companies, and and we're, we're partners with both, you know, William Morris Endeavor and 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 CA, and in so many ways, and I'm happy for for those relationships. Live Nations, as you mentioned, truly become a global player. Concerts in more than 43 countries. You said more than 40 million tickets. Are sold. I know this is not really in your department, your head of U.S. concerts here, but can you comment on what that means for the strength of the global economy and live live touring business? Yeah, so first of all, worldwide for Live Nation, uh, 80 million tickets this year, 40 million here in the U.S., so we're, we're about half of that. Artists want to really grow their brand worldwide. I mean, it's a worldwide economy now. You see it every day. You see all these companies getting listed on the American stock exchanges from, you know, China, you know, and, and uh, you know, other India and other South America, Brazil, you know, I mean, it's becoming a, a truly global economy and live entertainment is, is part of that global economy. Artists now have, a, I would say, a lot more confidence to tour locally. I mean, the logistics have become much, much easier and, and well-known. They are getting more confident with the promoter options that they have around the world. I think if you went back 10 or 12 years ago, I mean, I remember when I used to talk to Ian Copeland because he was one of really the first pioneers of international touring at FBI. And Ian would say, hey, we're going somewhere Manila. I'm like, how do you do that? He goes, we just get 100% up front. Doesn't matter after that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and nowadays, the ticketing companies, you know, that you can trust have expanded their sure. role. It's a big part of it. The money trail, the sources of that money. It's really become business just like the U.S. and in many of these markets that weren't developed fully, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. I mean, there's, there's still a long, long ways to go. And there's a lot of opportunity out there. I mentioned South America earlier today. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a huge, huge continent with, you know, a, a lot of upside potential, we believe. They love the music, live music down there. There's some giant festivals, as you know. Um, there's still not the same regularity of day-to-day -day concert activity like you see here or even in Europe. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's getting easier for artists to tour on a global basis, and Live Nation's got a great footprint to be able to facilitate that. So you've been delivering great experiences and great concerts around the world, and one of the things that's come out of the U.S. Concerts Office, uh, which I think is worth noting, because we've had successful tours when Harry Styles using Verified Fan, but it's Ticketmaster Verified Fan. I think that's going to be a big component of a lot of artists' array for, for marketing suite that comes out of Ticketmaster as a Ticketmaster product. That was you were instrumental in in setting that up, correct? So I, I, I wasn't like the architect, but I am a strong uh, supporter of it. And and like my hats off to George Smith and the entire Ticketmaster team for switching the way that they kind of think about their business. And and I'm hoping that that I was influential 
in getting them to think about their business a little bit different. That, that they, they are really a service company for the artists and fans. And, you know, the more I can get them to think about how do we service both artists and fans, our business combined is going to be a lot healthier. So when you, when you think about verified fans, we, we, we've sit down with so many of these artists to talk about tours and, you know, where they play. And then you start to talk about ticket price. And, and, and in recent years, there's been a lot of conversation about the secondary market and either money that's being left on the table um, for the artists who deserve every penny of it or, you know, uh, how fans are being mistreated because yeah. on sellout shows, they weren't able to get um, the tickets with a lot of, you know, electronic purchasing uh, methodologies, you know, primarily out of Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe. I mean, very, to me, criminal activity um, that, that, you know, just kind of gave, I don't know, just kind of gave the underworld an opportunity to, to get these, these tickets on the on sale. We needed to come up with a solution so we could get tickets in the hands of fans first and foremost. I mean, that's what we want. That's what the artists want. And that's what the fans deserve. So, you know, he, he employs an enormous amount of engineers and developers and, and, and software writers. And he invests so heavily in that business. And, and it is very capital intensive to do it right. But they started to reallocate some of their money few years ago and think about this problem and how we could approach it. And so they, they have come up with a product titled Verified Fan now, where essentially we can pre-register fans of an artist and first of all, make sure they're a real person. You know, you'd think it was simple, but not every ticket that's been purchased previously was purchased by a real person. And a lot of times it was purchased by a machine. So we qualify, first of all, everyone to make sure that it's someone like you or I. Are you doing this on every level, or is it just the arena acts like pink? It's, it's really any artist that would like to use the product, you know, we're able to do it. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's, right now I believe we have 50 artists um, that either have used it or are in the process of using it for an upcoming tour. I mean, Taylor Swift, you know, you know I, probably one of the hottest shows is going to be out on the road next year, uh, was highly, highly engaged with us on that, um, setting up the distribution and sales for her upcoming tour. Um, you mentioned, you know, Harry Styles. I mean, Bruce Springsteen, Springsteen. you know, who has been a, you know, such a strong advocate to making sure the fans got his tickets, um, worked with us on Verified Fans for his current shows playing in New York on Broadway. And, you know, the, the stories coming out of the artist community are just tremendous. And, and we really feel like we're at about a 95% success rate uh, of getting the initial tickets into the hands of a fan who actually goes to the event and, and is not out there reselling them or, you know, you know other, other things that, that we don't enjoy. And, and I love that aspect of verified fan and making sure it gets into the fan's hand. But it's not entirely altruistic, too. There's a downstream strategy to market into another Ticketmaster product, which is Ticketmaster Platinum. Right. You know, collecting that data, collecting that information about people gives you a chance to resell them into a, the verified reselling platform you've created in Ticketmaster Platinum. Yep. How many acts and how many tours you're working on are using Ticketmaster Platinum right now? So, so just so we don't like, I don't want to totally confuse the, the, the products, but so Platinum is essentially a pricing tool and platform to price to what we believe is the market. And we've been using Platinum pricing now for, I would say about four or five uh, years now, John Ketchum and his team in Chicago you know, they're, they're looking at a lot of the secondary pricing around the country. So it's Ticketmaster's answer to stu competing with StubHub and keeping the money back in the group's pocket. But Plat Platinum is a U.S. concerts team and product, okay? So I just want to make sure it's not necessarily a Ticketmaster product. The pricers work for U.S. concerts. They work for our team. So when we're sitting down with an artist and talking about how much they may want to gross out of an average arena tour or an amphitheater tour. Um, about 90% of the artists that we work with now utilize platinum. 
And so what they might do is take a few hundred seats, you know, I would say usually a maximum of 500, but usually between 200 and 500 a show. And these are not typically, you know, row one, row two tickets, but, you know, might be first row of price level three, might be some select other, what I would call premium seats. And they price those more to what the market um, um, value is. There. You know, but this can be a little boost of, you know, fifty to $100,000 into a show gross where the artist is taking out 90% of it. And yet the vast majority of the tickets um, in a 15,000 capacity venue, you know, are, are priced less than that. Yeah. What percentage of your artists are you, would you say are using it now? I think about 90. So clearly a pretty successful program yeah no i mean listen we 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 started with you know a couple of acts and you know listen you know most artists want to try to make as much money as they can for themselves and the others you know that that are dependent on those earnings and you know we we worked on an artist like bruce springsteen for many many tours and had all the facts on how much money was being left on the table um, and on you know on the last tour, they said, "Look, this is something we should really consider." And and you know every act is different; the choice is theirs. We just want to make sure that we're presenting all the knowledge that we've accumulated, getting it out to them, so they can make a decision on what their ticketing portfolio, you know, and pricing would look like for a tour. All right, we um, opened up questions to our listeners on the internet, and we got a tweet from Jason Bernstein. And he would like to know what's the best live show you've ever seen. Oh man, that's kind of like the pick A or B question. <laughs> um, look, I will tell you, and I don't know if anybody was there. I mean, Saturday night at Bridgestone, Chris Stapleton, um, you know, Sean and David, they they were able to get myself and our guests some some seats for the show. We literally watched it start to finish, and and I would say that is absolutely was one of the best shows. I have ever seen. I mean, just, you know, tremendous from start to finish. You know, I'm very familiar with his, all of his songs and, and, and generally familiar with the show itself. But to okay. get to sit down and watch, you know, two hours plus, every song is smash, audience singing along with the vast majority of them. Um, it, was, it was a tremendous experience, and, and I really enjoyed it. I want to talk about something that's a little sad lately. That our, It's more than a little sad, but our industry dealt with Las Vegas recently, and that was a show your company was involved with. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, boy. Um, well, I don't know. First of all, as, as we all know, uh, a, a, a tragedy to say, say the least, and uh, you know, not, not unlike you know, what transpired in, in Manchester earlier this year, uh, um, unexpected. You, know, you, you think about all the the greatness and, and, and kind of communal aspects of what we all do in this room and, um, you know, how, how, our, how the fans feel when they go to live events and all the joy that, that music, live music creates, you know, and, and to have something that evil, you know, take place, you know, it just doesn't, just doesn't belong in, in, in what we do. And, and uh, I saw Sid Greenfake here, you know, our, our, our partner, um, from MGM at uh, Route 91 Harvest, and and um, you know those those people and what what they went through is is just un, unimaginable, um, and and I hope it hope it never happens again. My primary job is to put on concerts and to provide fans with with great music, and I want to do that around the globe. The bounce back when you see you know artists like Adriana Grande coming right back and, and, and wanting to, you know, work and give back and get right back out there in, in the face of that adversity or, you know, my hat's off to Jason Aldean and what he went through right back on the road, you know, played this week, you know, um, a week later, you know, the, the artists and the fan community, you know, they're, they're, they're strong. I mean, we're in a strong country and, and uh, you've seen this on, on many, many levels, not just in the live uh, entertainment business, but you know, America's just not going to put up with this shit. We're going to get you know right back on our horse. And, yeah, I think that's well said. That's and clearly, the audience is too. I don't think there was a better place to end than America won't take that kind of shit. But we, we, 
That's since, not an A or B question. Yeah, that's, that's not either. But seriously, Bob Rue, everybody, thank you for the time today. Really enjoyed having you. Bob Rue, co-president of Live Nation Americas. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It was great. Hello, this is Sarah Mertz, Julia Frank, Zariel Hyatt, Ali Spagnola, LX, Marsha Flesick, Andrea Johnson, and we're on Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Promoter 101. Appearing live on Promoter 101. If you want to reach out to us, you can always send us an email at steiny at promoter101.net. Next week, Dan and I are back in the studio. We'll be at Dan's home in Seattle. I'll be here in Nashville. And Dan swears to have landed one of our biggest interviews to date yet, but doesn't tell me who it is. So who are we talking about, Dan? You're ready for this. We got the guy that books Dirks, Luke, Nickel Creek, Eric, Stapleton. That's right. Jay Williams is going to grace our stage on Promoter 101. Very excited about that. Be, be sure to tune in. Until next week, we're wishing you sold out shows. Thank you, Aiba. Well, thank you, everybody. Hi, my name is Jay Williams from WME, and you're listening to Promoter 101.